Hi folks, I'm here for part two of a three-part series with uh, our uh, colleague and uh, uh, resident star here at HSTM, uh, Dr. Stephanie Jew, who's been kind enough to share a couple of cases uh, with us uh, on the internet with the dentists at large. And we're gonna do the second case. So Stephanie, let's get straight to it and talk about this, the second case. Great. So the second case I had was a patient who had an immunodeficiency and also ended up having a C-shaped canal. The first thing that I kind of noticed about this patient was that he had HIV, he also had cardiomyopathy. So I just did a little bit of a lit review into the relationship between the two diseases. So heart failure in patients with HIV um, definitely used to be a much bigger problem, but with the advent of the heart medications, the highly active antiretroviral treatments, uh, it's become much less of the concern. A, a concern and a, much less of a, a life altering it's uh, controlled. consideration. Yeah. So another thing that I kind of looked into was the relationship between HIV and anodontics. So in 1989, Glick showed that they actually were able to isolate HIV from the dental pulp of patients with AIDS. But going along kind of those same lines, um, there wasn't necessarily evidence that patients with HIV or AIDS were more at risk for needing endodontic treatment. What about the abscess formation, of, you know, because they're immune compromised, obviously in later stages, an mm -hmm. abscess from endodontic disease could be a little bit more of a problem, right? Definitely. Spreading of it, yeah. Definitely. And now because of the retroviral drugs that are now readily available, we're having the HIV positive status more under control, so it's less of an issue, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important to ask patients about their status. Yeah, definitely. Um, and they, they also found in 2005, there was no difference in the healing of the necrotic teeth with chronic able abscesses at 12 months between the patients with and without the HIV when they were evaluating just kind of by radiographs by the PAI score. Another thing I found was just about the ADA's recommendations on treating patients with HIV, whether or not prophylactic antibiotics would have been necessary. So the ADA does not recommend the use of antibiotics uh, routinely as prophylaxis just because it could potentially uh, put the patient at risk to adverse drug reactions, super infections, or drug resistant microorganisms. In terms of treating the tooth, this was the initial radiograph that you started with. A patient was in a lot of pain. He presented for an emergency appointment. We did some testing and 18 was testing with lingering cold and positive to percussion. So some symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, symptomatic apical periodontitis, with a potential differential diagnosis of a fracture because I could see kind of a hairline on the lingual surface there, but I wasn't getting any probe depths. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't definitely, it wasn't at the very top of my list. So we went ahead and started the root canal and ended up finding the C-shaped canal there. And originally when I started, I had found three and was thinking that there would be a fourth kind of looking for that symmetry and not necessarily recognizing that it was a C-shape. Um, so definitely recognizing that you know it's not necessarily going to be symmetrical when you're in there looking for the canals is an important lesson. Yeah, definitely. I mean, C-shaped canals are, um, are challenging in many different ways. I'm sure we're going to get into some of that literature right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, recognizing that you have a C-shaped canal is primarily the key thing because you do have to manage it a little bit differently in terms of you know your irrigation sequence, even instrumentation, and so that you don't end up perforating looking for additional canals that mm -hmm. may not be there. Of course, CBCTs now is a really key thing with that. But go ahead and talk about the, um, some of the literature you may want to talk about on C-shaped canals. Yeah, so in C-shaped canals, there's a classic paper by Cook and Cox from 1979 showing that it was occurring in as many as 8% of mandibular second molars when they looked at them clinically. A more recent paper from 2021 by Yang just kind of looked at the morphology of what it looks like more towards the apex and showing that there's a risk for strip perforation because of the thinning that you get from that C shape. So being right. careful not to work it up to too high of an apical size. So you don't get that strip perforation. Exactly. And even coronally in the mid root portion mm -hmm. of it because of the, you know, it's a folding of the roots and, and the folds inside. So the inner portion, the central aspect of the tooth is, is most vulnerable. You have to be very careful when instrumenting. So yeah, I think it had a really good outcome. The patient's um, pain was completely resolved and now he was able to go back to his general dentist to get the crown on the tooth. Terrific. So also this, so we talked about 8% in general population based on that study, mm -hmm. but I mean that that is variable also in different populations, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's mostly in the second molars, primarily in second molars, mm -hmm. uh, and mandibular second molars 
animals are the more, most common place, and uh, population-wise, I think there have been other studies that show that it's much higher in, in on the Far East and the um, um, Asian population that could run as high as I've heard, 25 percent, right, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. So it's pretty high in the 20 to 30 percent range. So key is to recognize it and to go from there. One thing Stephanie is really important in these cases because of that folding that we mentioned there's a lot of thinning going on right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think is a good way to clean and disinfect those areas because you can't really put a file in there. We right. talked about if you go to a large enough size you could potentially perforate. Right. So what is the best way to irrigate and clean and disinfect that space? So really important in these situations to use some sort of ultrasonic irrigation to activate the irrigant to make sure it's able to get into all those fins and isthmuses and you're really able to clean in there since you're not able to instrument mechanically you you want to use your solvent to clean the area. Yeah, uh, your disinfectants, I mean, the vital case, you want to use your hypochlorite, obviously, at, at a high rate. Large volume is necessary enough time mm -hmm. to make sure that you get enough digestion. Activation of that solution is also very important, using mm -hmm. ultrasonics and different means of activation. Ultimately, it's just uh, the more infected and necrotic it is, if you really don't feel you've had enough time, that's the time where you want to put some calcium hydroxide in there, allow it to kind of mm -hmm. disinfect over a couple of weeks and then come back and then fill out at that time uh, when you have more assurance. Thanks for the quick tutorial on this area. Thank you. See you in the next video.